Our topic tonight is Arianism versus the Trinity. <laughs> so that's two complex words, Arianism and the Trinity. So we're going to have to define some of what we're talking about in order to actually make any comparison. So what is Arianism? So a couple years ago, um, Leandro and I and Mike were able to go to the city of Ravenna in Italy, um, which has always been very high on my list of places to go. It is not high on most people's places because they don't think of Ravenna. They think of Florence and Venice and some Milan and so forth. Um, but Ravenna is really important at a very particular and strange time, which is the late antiquity. The, at the, as the Roman Empire in the West is falling, this became the capital of the West Roman Empire. And then after the Ro West Roman Empire fell, this is the capital of the Visigoth, I'm sorry, Ostrogothic kingdom uh, that replaced the Roman uh, state. Uh, and then actually after the East Roman Empire, after the Byzantines conquered uh, Italy from the Ostrogoths, it became again the provincial capital uh, of Italy, when Italy now is reduced to being a province of the Byzantine Empire. And so it actually has the strange thing of, is in this time period when um, the Roman state is collapsing, this is a time period when um, uh, very few buildings anywhere else are being built, and now there's a new city that is built in, in this sort of style when nothing else is being built. Anyway, so one of the interesting components of Ravenna is that a bunch of these buildings were built not by the late Romans, the end of the Roman Empire, or by the Byzantines, but in between, when it is the capital of the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy. And so Theodoric the Great, great king of the Ostrogoths, whose capital was Ravenna. He was an Arian Christian, and so he built um, Arian churches, he built an Arian palace, he built his mausoleum, which is a really amazing, interesting, concrete thing, nine-sided building, very unusual uh, classically. Um, and he built a baptistry, and so a baptistry was a kind of building that was um, for baptisms, and in the early years of Christianity, baptisms and baptistries was a big thing because uh, most Christians were actually converts initially, um, because most people were not born Christian originally. It's only after the empire becomes um, fully Christian that you know it becomes more like today, where you're just baptizing um, children or young people, babies sometimes. And so this is a mosaic at the dome of the baptistry depicting Jesus. Um, and we have to kind of understand, I mean, it's not entirely clear what makes this Aryan as opposed to what makes this, um, uh, what would, it, what would a, uh, an Orthodox or Catholic um, baptistry look like? And part of it might be, um, you know, this is kind of a, a, a non-manly, non-muscular, nude, unbearded Jesus on the one hand. Uh, and so that might be part of it. And so it's kind of an interesting so idea, and we'll talk about what Arianism is, but this is just a first image I wanted to show you. Okay, so Arianism with an I is not to be confused with the word, or with Arianism with a Y. And indeed, the word Arianism with an I has nothing to do with the word Arianism with a Y. So Arianism with a Y is derived from the Arians, who were an Indo-European and Indo-Iranian people, who entered into northern India as conquerors from the steppes of Central Asia around 1500 BC. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the Nazis and before them, um, uh, essentially white supremacists, pseudo-scientists, pseudo-historians, um, picked up on the idea, they came up with a very false reading of history that, um, that the Indo-Europeans were some, so Indo-European is a, is a scholarly created name for um, a, a people that is theorized based on 
um, on philology. So the fact that all of these languages from India to Europe and many places in between are uh, related to one another. And so Latin and Greek and Russian and Sanskrit and Persian, you know, and, and Celtic. And they're all related languages and they have branched off and are very different from one another. But um, people in the 19th century realized that um, there's a lot of words that sound very similar in ancient Sanskrit as what sounds in ancient Greek and ancient Latin and so forth. And so, anyway, so the pseudoscientists, the white supremacists assume that this is a, also an Ur white race, and that's why they um, ran off the steps and conquered so many places and spread around somewhere and so forth. That's not the case at all. Um, and so unfortunately, because that was part of the Nazis, white supremacist, racist ideology, they adopted the word Aryan from um, this Indo-Iranian people in India, and then they also appropriated an Indian symbol, the swastika, which is an ancient um, Aryan or Indian um, religious symbol, which unfortunately has been totally, <laughs> totally ruined by the Nazis, of course. Um, anyway, and so this is an example, uh, a statue that was at the entrance of the Reich Transfery, put there by the Nazis in 1939, which is essentially showing Aryan racial characteristics that they wanted to promote or so forth. So like I say, um, the Nazis appropriated the actual Aryans. The Aryans were a real people, the indo european people. They don't have anything to do with debunked ideas about racial supremacy. Okay, so the Aryanism that we're going to talk about tonight, Aryanism with an I, is named for a guy called Arius. And so Arius was an Alexandrian Christian priest and he's pictured here at left being punched or slapped uh, at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 by none other than St. Nicholas, good old St. Nick, Santa Claus. And so we don't always think of Santa Claus as having a, a, a rotten temper. I mean, he is quite mean to Rudolph in the Rudolph special, and he's still a little bit bigoted in the Rudolph special, but in any event, he's, his, as a saint, he has a reputation for generosity and kindness and so forth, but uh, also apparently no tolerance for Arius and Arianism, according to legend anyway. Okay, so at the beginning um, of the fourth century, Arius, this priest from Alexandria, Egypt, was an influential Christian theologian. Arius was alive at the time Christianity was coalescing from multiple local communities that were effectively all autonomous from each other. So the way Christianities had emerged, they had grown in a diversity of ways. We've gone through a lot about how in the earliest years there was no one way to be a Christian. There were multiple interpretations that were very different and often uh, very much at odds with each other. And so now this is this kind of a time period when some of the um, some of the different major rivals are waning. So the um, Jewish law-abiding Christians are now been very much sidelined. They still exist, but they aren't as important. And that is also true for some of the other groups like um, uh, the Gnostics and so forth. There are still Gnostics, but they are not going to be, that's not the way things are going to go. At this point, um, Christianity is, the, the, the mainstream of Christianity is already sort of backing around the ideas of what we call the proto-Orthodox, what's going to eventually become the Orthodox slash Catholic, the Nicene tradition. But there is still a massive amount of diversity within this. And effectively, all of the little Christian communities are functionally independent of each other. So what's happening in Alexandria is under the, under the um, jurisdiction of the Patriarch of Alexandria, who is pretty much autonomous in his own right, he doesn't really have anything that he can do or say about the, what's happening over in the bishopric you know, of, uh, of Seville or of, you know, uh, of Gaul or wherever the other places that are the bishops. In other words, each independent uh, church is their own thing. So now that's coalescing 
with the, in Arius' time, with the conversion of the Emperor Constantine. We had a whole lecture on that very recently. And so now um, it is coming together as a single institution that is backed by the Roman government itself. So in this backdrop, Arius, this is a time of Christological um, controversy, and we'll talk about what that means. Arius formulated a Christology, uh, and it's one that lost out in the debate process at this time. So what's Christology? Christology is the study of Christ. It is essentially Christians trying to make sense of Jesus. So like I say, it's a technical word. It's used to describe the many ways Christians have tried to make sense of the historical Jesus, the Jesus Christs as described in Scripture, and ultimately also the idea that Christ is God. So we have the historical Jesus of Nazareth, who we talked about an awful lot. We have the divine man, Jesus Christ, as portrayed or actually given multiple different and contradictory portraits in the canonical scripture and the extra canonical scriptures. And then finally, we have the theological idea of Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Logos, uh, the divine image, divine wisdom, and so forth. How do we understand the theological idea? Okay, so in ancient times, in Middle Ages and early modern times, this is before the development of the modern academic discipline of history. So Christians largely just assumed that the events described in the gospel occurred pretty much as written. So the actual historical Jesus was not part of their consideration. They had no access to the historical Jesus after the last people who knew the historical Jesus died. And so they only have essentially pictures of Jesus written by Christians uh, in text. You know, not, not real pictures. They don't have any portraits until very late. Um, but in any event, there's the ones that are not, um, they assume it's historical even if it's not. So significant questions remain. So the Christians say, figure, sure, okay, Jesus was both human and divine. He's a divine man when he's portrayed in the scripture, but precisely what way? In the lecture we just had on divine men, we saw there's all kinds of different ways that that can happen. There are uh, demigods that are born of the union of uh, a, a god and a human, either a human man and a goddess or a, a god and a human woman. There are um, people who are made into divinity, so in other words, that have uh, undergo theosis. Um, there are people who have, um, because of the uh, amazing way that they live philosophically, morally, and ethically, um, they essentially have a divine spark in them and seem divine. So there are a number of ways that you could be a divine man. Which way was Jesus? And then also we have this understanding that sure, Christ is God, the Logos, Christ's Logos, the wis Holy Wisdom, and so forth. Those are God, the Savior is God. But how does Christ, God, relate to the Father as God, the Heavenly Parent? And so those questions are still being worked out. So in the first centuries of the religion, Christians really focused on trying to understand precisely how Jesus was a divine man? In what way was he divine? In what way was he human? So was he born a man who lived such a perfect life that God made him divine, that God essentially adopted him as God's son? Was he born divine and human in equal parts? Or was he really kind of a God the whole time, or God divine in such a way that he only appeared to be human. And so some Christians in each of, uh, believed in each of these Christological conceptions in the first and second centuries especially. So um, in general, conceptions that emphasize Jesus' humanity uh, are called low Christology, while those that emphasize his divinity are called high Christology. 
And by the way, you can, you can find uh, scriptural support for both. So um, the scriptures are all written before the development of the idea of the Trinity. You can use scriptures to support that idea, but they, did not, they were not written with that idea in mind. Uh, and likewise, you can use scriptural examples to support um, all kinds of other things. So docetism, as we'll see, and, and other um, uh, Arianism. <laughs> there are other, all kinds of Christologies can be used the scriptures to support. So, um, for example, the portrait that we have of Jesus in the kind of earthy gospel of Mark really tries to portray Jesus's humanity. And so Jesus is a guy who gets frustrated, he gets angry. Um, there's all kinds of things that don't seem very, um, you know, perfectly philosophical or, or, or God-like how you would expect the perfect God walking around to act. By contrast, the Jesus as portrayed in the Gospel of John seems like he's always omniscient, always dispassionate, and throughout the entire narrative, so you don't get the impression really that he's even human at all. Um, in that gospel. And I'm making that as extreme, but you have both divine and human in both, but, they're, but they do depict different uh, Christological portraits. So for the low Christology, um, the adoptionists are an example of an early Christian group that has a low Christology. So many, and maybe even most, this might have been the, the most important early, or most co common anyway, early uh, idea among most of the Christians. They believe that Jesus was born a human, but then was exalted by God, becoming God's only begotten son. Either maybe that happened at his baptism, or when he was transfigured, or at the crucifixion, or when he's resurrected, or possibly when he ascends into heaven. At one of those events, at some point or other, he becomes uh, God's only begotten. And because um, all early Christians had a testimony that Christ lived according to Scripture, died according to Scripture, and was raised again according to Scripture. They used Scripture, which is to say the Hebrew Bible, the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. They used that to look at what they considered to be messianic um, predictions, and they assumed that uh, Jesus lived according to those because they had that assumption to begin with. And so the, in Psalm 2, verse 7, God the Father says, You are my son, I have begotten you this day. And so that becomes a way to understand Jesus becoming the divine only begotten son at some point during his life. And so in some versions of, in some manuscript versions of the baptism of Jesus story, when uh, a voice from heaven speaks, um, thus, this psalm verse is quoted instead of, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He says, you are my son, I have begotten you this day. Uh, and that would support an adoptionist reading, the idea that Jesus had begun as a man, but has been adopted and then becomes exalted as uh, a divine being who is nevertheless um, not God in the sense of uh, since God has always been God, this is a man who becomes exalted as a divine being, a God, let's say. Simultaneously, there is a very high Christ, uh, Christology at the very other end of the spectrum um, uh, where Christians are emphasizing Jesus' divinity. Um, and sometimes this goes so far as to extend to denying his humanity. And so uh, a group which... Uh, we now call the docetists, from the Greek word dokane, which means to seem. Um, people who think that this is an illusion or that the human Christ, Jesus walking around, was simply an illusion. And docet docetists include folks like the Gnostics, generally. Um, they believed that Jesus only seemed human. So, yes, at some times he was walking around and he looked like a human. Other times, when you look, he would look very different. And so they're in the apocryphal... Um, Gospels, we often have Jesus even shape-shifting and things like that, uh, and that's a docetic um, way of saying, yes, some people were fooled into thinking Jesus was human, but he really only seemed human. 
the real truth is that the whole physical world is corrupt. Matter is corrupt for the Docetists and the Gnostics. And thus, um, it would be a corruption of uh, God's true son, a fully spiritual being, to actually take on real material flesh like all of our sparks are, are trapped in. Uh, instead, he seemed to do that as a pathway to bring us back so that we can eventually shed free of these material forms. And so thus, um, um, there's even just very kind of, I think, uncomfortable pictures of seeing the, um, let's say, fake or empty husk, the body, supposed body or illusionary body of Jesus on the cross and the true Jesus in some of these um, apocryphal, docetic, Gnostic scriptures, the, the true spiritual Jesus is even laughing at the image because, uh, because it's, it's, it's a joke. That's never, that didn't happen uh, in any kind of real sense. There was no, no suffering. Okay, there's then a middle path, and that is usually always the path of the proto-Orthodox. Like I say, this group that is ultimately going to win, and so uh, it's the group of people whose ideas are going to win out and become the main line of all Christianity from the fourth century onward. So this group believed that from his birth, Jesus was both divine and human. They, this nevertheless still left the question, does Jesus, who was both divine and human, does he have a single human divine nature, in other words, one nature period, and that is called monophysitism? Or does Jesus have two natures after he, after he begins his incarnation? In other words, once he's born, does he have two natures inside him, a divine nature and a human nature, which is diophysitism? Okay, so this is a quick pop quiz for any of you who are Christians or post-Christians who are listening. <laughs> So which of these two beliefs makes you a heretic? If you like right now said, okay, you think, yeah, no, yeah. Jesus, of course, Jesus only has one nature. He has a, a single fully divine, fully human nature. Or does he actually have two distinct natures? He has a fully human nature and a fully divine nature. Which one of those do you believe? <laughs> okay, so if you said one nature, then you're most likely a heretic <laughs> because what they ended up deciding in their very technical thing uh, in uh, the, whatever, the fifth and sixth centuries is that, um, that Jesus has two natures. And so that, that's a little asterisk here. If you are Oriental Orthodox, if you are part of the Coptic church, the uh, Ethiopian, Eritrean churches, the Assyrian church, the churches of the East and so forth, it's the other's heresy. It's then you have, then you have, Myophysitism, which is a, it's a variation on monophysitism. It's a later compromise. But in other words, then it's not a heresy. For everybody else, um, it would be uh, in the main line anyway. It, uh, you have to be orthodox by saying two natures. So it gets pretty technical. And I think actually a lot of times Christians don't even know what they're supposed to believe on these things. So, okay. So this was a debate within the proto-orthodox thing. So that adoptionist docetist divide, that played out earlier, and that's at its height in the second century, although it continues. Then that two versus one nature debate, that comes later, and so it's at its height in the fifth century. So the Arian controversy we're talking tonight takes place largely at the beginning of the fourth century, through the middle of the fourth century too. But it has lingering effects into the seventh centuries, as we'll see. Uh, and so let's look at what this is about. So Arius is focused on Christ's relationship with God the Father. How is Christ as God um, distinct from, or how do we understand the two in relation to one another? So Christianity has um, a complex conception of God. So there is, Christians are absolutely monotheist. Christians just like Muslims and Jews affirm that there is absolutely one, only one God, one source, one first cause, one prime mover. In other words, the source of all meaning, meaning itself. There's only one God. And yet, unlike Muslims and Jews, where, where it's, the conception is simpler, although they also have 
um, complexities that they don't often consider the way Christians do all the time. Um, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, Christians have a much more immediate in front of them paradoxical understanding of God since Christians also affirm that the Father or the parent is God, that Christ, the Logos, is God, God's Word is God, and the Spirit is God. And so one God only, and you know, we've just, I just said three different persons here are God. So how is that logically possible? So the simplest logical solution to that argument is, well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all really simply aspects of that same one God. There's one God, and all three of these that we're seeing are equal to each other. They are all the same. Jesus is the Father. Jesus is the Spirit. The Spirit is the Father. All three are simply aspects of the one God. So this is called modalism. So in the same way that you can experience water in the form of liquid that you can drink, or as a solid in the form of ice, or you can boil it away as water vapor, you can sometimes experience that same one God in different aspects. So you can experience God in the aspect of the unknowable, unseeable creator, or sometimes as God's glory, God's word, the sun, or through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as God. But really, since the Holy Spirit is the Father in modalism, it's really all the same, and you're just experiencing different aspects or modes of God. By the way, these are heresies. <laughs> so, so in other words, these are not, these were what some early Christians believe, but not today, and by and large, are these parts of the Christian. But I'm just saying that this is a way that many Christians tried to figure this out, and it's an easy way to understand it. Okay. So, and there's another one. Well, so maybe Jesus is just part of the one God. So this is what's called partialism. So another strategy is to see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as different parts of the one God, the same one God. So there's a famous legendary account of St. Patrick, patron saint of Ireland, who goes uh, from ancient Britain to Ireland, and he uses supposedly a shamrock, you know how um, most clovers are three leaf, not as opposed to a four leaf clover. And so uh, the four one leaf ones are, are lucky, but the common ones are three leaf. So he uses that to show right here that you see how that's kind of like a clubs or a three leaf clover. He teaches the Irish, the pagans, Irish pagans. That's how the Trinity works. There's, there's in fact three, three persons here, but it's all in one, um, one leaf, even though it has the three circles. So actually that would be if, that, if he was teaching that, which he didn't teach that, that's a later legend, it really is a problem that would be such effectively saying, be, be teaching partialism, not Trinitarianism, because effectively each of those three round subleafs is just part of the same leaf. And so that's not, that's not how the Trinity works. That's, all one, that's really a one God thing, and where each individual component is a subleaf is part of the rest, right? So... Um, another example of that is to a partialism would be trying to say something like, well, uh, you know, so Jesus is fully God. Jesus is 100% God. The Father is 100% God. Uh, and so let's do it the same way. The Pacific Ocean is 100% water. The Atlantic Ocean is 100% water. But the Pacific by itself is not 100% of all the water that exists. And thus what we're saying is the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic Ocean, you know, all the water together that is the whole God, but the Pacific is still its own thing. And so that is, um, again, partialism, because what you're more or less saying is that each person, Christ, is simply a part of the God, of the whole God, you know? So you can see how that's different. Partialism. So that's another um, way that a lot of early Christians said, okay, well, that makes sense to me when you hold up a, a shamrock, um, but nevertheless, that's a heresy. Okay. So modalism and partialism, like I say, do a very good job of preserving the unity of God. There's no doubt if you're saying that looking at Jesus is just part of the leaf or just the Atlantic Ocean and that God, the real God is all ocean, all water or whatever, and then you're really saying that you're, you're really focused on the oneness of God, monotheism. However, when you go down that path, 
you get other conceptual problems. So, so if Jesus is a son, you need to have a father. And if you were the same, if it's the same being or just parts of the same being or just modes of the same being appearing, how can you really be your own father? Or how can you really be your own son? It doesn't really make any sense. You're really not a father if you're only the father to another mode of you and so forth, right? Likewise, if Jesus is simply the father in another mode or part of the same God, um, God never really is actually doing a sacrifice. In other words, it's not God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son uh, and so forth. Um, because really, it's just God who now becomes Jesus and is sacrificed and then leaves again, you know? And so it's like a mode that the one God is, simply the Father that's doing all that, and it's complex to understand exactly why. So it seems like you've got an easy logical solution with modalism and partialism, but, you know, who is Jesus praying to in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's saying, you know, and, or, or on the cross, Father, forgive them, or anything like that? If he's the Father... <laughs> in a different mode or a different part of him. He's praying to a different part of himself or he's praying to himself in a different mode. Um, it's hard to square that too. Okay, so ultimately, we're just gonna point out here, the Nicene Trinitarian formula definitely defies logic. And so this is how it's most easily structured, right? So we have the idea here you know, the hands reaching down, the, that's the unseeable, unknowable creator, the father, heavenly parent, heavenly mother, we can say. It, heavenly father is God. And then the Christ, the Logos, Jesus is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. But the father is not the son. The son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the father, right? And so that absolutely defies logic. So the formula, <laughs> you know, if you have a formula um, that B equals A and C equals A, then logically and in math and geometry by the transitive principle, if B equals A and C equals A, then B equals C. But in the doctrine of the Trinity, it is asserted that B does not equal C. And so therefore you can see right here in a in an equal sign logical um, diagram here, there's an immediate logical contradiction here. So as a result, the final orthodox slash Nicene conception of the Trinity that became mainline conception in Christianity, it's a paradox. And right from the start, um, Christians have said that it has to be understood as a mystery, it cannot be understood literally, it shouldn't be understood as being uh, limiting or that this conception is somehow the totality of what God is in a very, you know, in a very uh, binding kind of way. Rather, um, a phrase we use is we limit not the truth of God. This is simply a human conception of how to understand uh, an, the unknowable. Okay, so Arius, however, doesn't like a logical contradiction. That is not, um, that does not uh, suit his philosophical training. He doesn't think that it um, makes any sense. Uh, Self-contradiction is kind of the beginning principle and like Aristotelian logic of, of essentially having untruth. So Arius' um, formulation of how Christ relates to the Father preserves strict monotheism, and it does so by demoting Christ to being the first divine creation of the one God. So that eliminates the logical contradiction. So Christ is still divine. Christ is a divine created being, created before all the rest of creation, more important than all the rest of creation, but nevertheless, at some point created. So the creator, God, the father, God, brought Christ into being. And so, at a, there, so Arius asserts, there was a, at some point, whether or not it might have even been before time exists, um, Christ was not. Whereas that can't be said for God, God always was, always is, always shall be. So only, only God, which is to say the Father, is fully eternal. And so thus, although divine and full of glory, 
Christ isn't God in the sense of being eternal and is therefore, because God is what is the only being that is eternal and infinite, Christ is, then, is nevertheless, is therefore, must be infinitely less glorious than the Creator, since the Creator then becomes, in Arius, Arius' conception, the sole eternal source of all. Okay, so we, because Arius is writing, um, is ultimately condemned as heretical and therefore consigned to the flames. So one of the early, um, earliest, first book burnings essentially of the uh, Christian church now, uh, as it's combined together into an institution uh, under the patronage of the emperor. Uh, the first thing they do is have a big book burning. They burn all of Arius' writings. And so, unfortunately, most of them do not survive. However, we do have a kind of a long fragment of his book, the Thalia, which means the banquet. And that's preserved in a quotation by his enemy, Athanasius, who was writing a long um, book ripping on Arius. But in any event, in doing that, he quoted him extensively, and that allows us to see what Arius said anyway. So Arius writes, God himself, one of the complicated things whenever we're talking about Trinity and the persons of the Trinity is, we so often use the word God specifically to relate to the Father that people trip up really fast because we're trying to say, we're trying to refer to that person particularly, but sometimes they just use the word God even though God refers in the Trinity to the whole system and also to the individual persons. So God could, if you say God, you could just mean Christ or you could mean the Spirit, although we almost never do. So God himself, the Father, Arius says, as he really is, is inexpressible to all. He alone has no equal, no one similar, and no one of the same glory. This is the, this is the real God. We call him unbegotten in contrast to him who by nature is begotten. So this is the only unbegotten, the first mover, the principal cause, because we, as we all know, we call Christ <clears throat> the only begotten son. Well, if he's begotten, then, um, then the implication in Arius' interpretation of what begotten means is that at some point or other, there was a time when Christ hadn't been begotten yet and therefore was not, did not exist. God, by contrast, is unbegotten. We praise him as without beginning in contrast to him who has a beginning. So Christ at some point began. We worship him as timeless, timeless in contrast to him who in time has come to exist. He, the Father, is without beginning, made the Son a beginning of created things. The Father produced him as a Son for himself by begetting him. He, the Son, has none of the distinct characteristics of God's own being, for he is not equal to, nor is he of the same being as the Father. God the Father is wise, for he himself is the teacher of wisdom, which is the Son, sufficient proof that God is invisible to all. The Father is invisible to all. God the Father is invisible to both things which were made through the Son and also to the Son himself. So, as we see all that, the Father is unbegotten, the Son's begotten, the Father's eternal, the Son came into being, the Son has a totally different substance, an essence from the Father. Okay, so Arius goes on to say, I will say specifically how the invisible is seen by the Son, by that power by which God, the Father, is able to see, each according to his own measure, the Son can bear to see the Father as is determined. So there is a triad not equal in glories. So we have a tri not, a quite, not a trinity of equal beings, but a triad not equal in glories. Their beings are not mixed together amongst themselves. There is a triad of beings. There is Father, Son, and Spirit, but the Father is infinite, and so therefore beyond, far surpassing the other in glories. As far as their glories, one infinitely more glorious than the other. The Father in his essence is a foreigner to the Son because he exists without beginning. Understand that the monad, the one, the God all by himself, eternally was, but the dyad, the two of them together, father and son, was not 
before it came into existence. It immediately follows that although the Son did not exist, the Father was still God. So God was always God, even without the Son. God doesn't need the Son to be God. So this is a much more strict monotheism. Yes, we're saying, yes, the Son's divine and all these things, but so much less than the Father. Hence the Son, not being eternal, came into existence by the Father's will. He is the only begotten God, and this, is, and this one is alien from all others. Wisdom, which is the Son, came to be wisdom by the will of the wise God. Hence, he is conceived in innumerable aspects. So the Son is all of these different hypostases of God. He is spirit, he is power, he is wisdom, he is God's glory, truth, God's image, God's word, the logos. So understand that he is also conceived of as radiance, as light. So the Son is lots of glorious stuff here. The one who is superior is able to beget one equal to the Son, but not someone more important or superior or greater. At God's, the Father's will, the Son has the greatest uh, the greatness and qualities that he has, his existence from when and from whom and from then are all from God. So nevertheless, as great as this all is, uh, the Logos here is dependent on God who would be God without all of those things. So where do some of these ideas come from? Well, there's a really interesting scriptural precedent for Arius' conception and this is the speech of divine wisdom from the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew Bible. And so this is what I'm saying is, I was suggesting here that uh, Christianity has, a, you know, as a monotheist religion, has a lot of complex, complex issues here with having the Father, um, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. But this, these same problems of, uh, of eternal ideas exist in Judaism as well. This was running around in the Hebrew Bible. And so, for example, in this passage of Proverbs, we have a divine being, wisdom, who is separate from God, uh, even though Judaism is monotheist. And so, um, how does that, how is that reconciled? Well, um, We've seen already, we had a lecture on Philo of Alexandria, who essentially posits um, that God, you know, the in, um, God the Father, the Source, the invisible God, um, nevertheless has um, hypostases that are emanating from God, like God's Word, God's Spirit, God's Logos, who in some sense are knowable and seeable, who in some sense are... Um, still God, but are also separate from God. And so that already prefigures and influences maybe even um, uh, uh, the Christian idea of, of Trinity and understanding of God. And I'll just mention in, in Islam, you think that they don't have that, but actually they do. So in Sunni Islam, the, um, uh, a precept uh, for many Sunni Muslims, and there's all kinds of different understandings of how Islam works, is that the Quran itself, uh, God's spoken word, the holy scripture of Islam, is also uncreated and it is co-eternal with God the creator. So in other words, the Quran as it is um, uh, written in early medieval Arabic, that has always existed before all of creation, before the universe began and everything and it actually is timeless and eternal just like God. Well, so if so, if that's the case, according to um, uh, anyway, Greek theology and philosophy, um, that means that the Quran is a second hypostasis, hypostasis of God, and that there are in fact two persons of a, a, du, a, not a, a dyad, not a, not a, a trinity in, in Islam, um, but that would be a, a two-god godhead, uh, if that's the case. Otherwise, because in other words, since the Quran is eternal. If otherwise, if for real monotheism, you have to have only a monad, and the monad creates the Quran. So at some point or other, the Quran did not has to come into being if if we're it is fully monotheistic without uh, two persons within a dyad godhead. So I don't think a lot of Muslims think about that. <laughs> so anyway, this is from the uh, Hebrew Bible, from the Book of Proverbs. This is wisdom speaking, a divine being. I wisdom 
dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. I love those who love me and seek, and those who seek me find me. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works before the deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depth, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so that the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth, I, then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. Now then, my children, listen to me, listen to wisdom. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. So this passage illustrates that even within Judaism, monotheism is complicated. So the book of Proverbs portrays wisdom as a divine being, presence with God at the creation, and given birth uh, by God before the creation. And so you can see how that very much fits into um, the idea. So um, Arius said that Christ is God's word, God's logos, but also God's wisdom. And so uh, here we understand uh, that Arius is drawing from like a passage like this. Uh, and it is showing that wisdom is a creation, even so, even if it's the earliest and most important creation. So for Arius, the wisdom logos is later incarnate as Christ. So the book of Proverbs doesn't have any idea like that, that that's gonna happen. <laughs> but obviously for a Christian, that's how Arius understands it. So this is a very important divine being, but as Arius says, still infinitely less than the creator who is the one, uh, uh, first cause, the true source. So Arius also explained his core beliefs to a like-minded bishop in Anatolia, what's now Turkey, a guy named Eusebius of Nicomedia, and he says, Arius says, look, there's all kinds of different ideas about, uh, about how Christ works. So some of them say the sun is an erectation. It's a belch, so there's a... Um, it's a Gnostic version of, uh, of history that, uh, I'm sorry, of cosmology that where um, essentially the universe is produced by belching or even laughing. Others say that he is a production. Others say that he is also unbegotten. So um, it's a partisan use of this word here. So Arius is, say, is essentially saying that begotten means created. And obviously the Nicene folks are going to say that there is a very big difference between begotten and made. So they say begotten, not made. Uh, Arius is saying if for Jesus to have ever to be eternal, like for Christ to be eternal, like the father, we would have to call him unbegotten when we actually do call him begotten. So this is his um, kind of partisan jab here. So there are some people who say that he's eternal but he's using a partisan phrase for that. So these are impieties to which we cannot listen, even though the heretics threaten us with a thousand deaths. So even though, um, you know, in this we're, we're showing because um, Arius is condemned as a heretic by the proto-Orthodox and is remembered that way and his, get, his followers get um, wiped out eventually by the mainline uh, Christianity, he nevertheless also has that same conception. People who don't believe with him are the heretics. So for him, Arians are the true believers and it's the proto-Orthodox are heretics along with the Gnostics and so forth. Heretics threaten us with a thousand deaths, but we say and believe and have taught and do teach that the Son is not unbegotten, nor in any way part of the unbegotten, and that he does not derive his substance from any matter but that by his own will and counsel he has subsisted before time and before ages as perfect as God, 
only unbegotten, I'm sorry, only begotten and unchangeable, and that before he was begotten or created or purposed or established, he was not. For he was not unbegotten. We are persecuted because we say the Son has a beginning, but that God is without beginning. And so this is really the crucial thing uh, for between Arius and uh, his rivals, uh, the Proto-Orthodox, the other Proto-Orthodox, the people who are going to win out. So even though Christ here is existing maybe before time itself, you know, the rest of creation, and is as perfect as God, is unchangeable, is God's only begotten, nevertheless, at some point or other, Christ had a beginning, and so he, unlike God, did not exist at some point. So Arius was a priest in Alexandria. Alexandria, prior to Christianity even, had been the center of the Hellenistic world, the center of uh, Greek thought after, um, after the classical period when the, the former uh, cosmopolitan capital, Athens, transferred and it became the center of learning. Even then, after uh, the rise of Christianity, this continues to be a sophisticated center of learning and a sophisticated center for Christian theologians. Um, and so uh, the bishop at the time, who is actually named Alexander, and so Alexander of Alexandria, Alexander had originally asked Arius to actually look at this question and to, do, um, to think about it and write about it. But Alexander was not pleased one bit with the conclusions that Arius uh, reached. And so um, eventually he decided that he had to excommunicate Arius and expel him from the Alexandria church, which was um, a divisive move. So it's not unpopular and popular. It's both unpopular and popular because it had torn the church apart so much that a lot of people believed Arius. He's a very compelling, smart speaker, and a lot of people uh, absolutely opposed him. So nevertheless, even though uh, he got excommunicated, Arius continued to have supporters all around the empire, and it caused a lot of internal church divisions all over the place. So Constantine, uh, the first Christian emperor, part of his hopes in embracing the religion may have been, um, like I say, this was an era for the Roman Empire of a great spiritual crisis, the breakdown of faith in uh, the lo very localized pagan cult traditions that had existed, the kind of excitement about um, Greco-Roman moral philosophy, the excitement about different mystery religions. Um, this was a religion that Constantine himself had faith in and thought maybe, you know, if he had a lot of insight, we don't know, it was a long way away for this to happen, maybe eventually would be a unified buying force for his divided empire, and actually, ultimately, it does become that. Nevertheless, the church that he inherited was itself very divided, and so um, he decided that he needed to impose order and unity on this church that he was inheriting, and he did that by doing something that had never been done before. He called all of the church's bishops, semi-autonomous bishops all over together, called them all together for what ended up being called an ecumenical council for oikumenoi, in other words, universe. This is calling everybody in the whole universe together. It's, the, it's like the World Series, but you know, it's only teams in the United States. This is the whole universe, but actually only the Roman Empire uh, is what they're talking about. So the Council of Nicaea in 325. And this is where uh, Santa Claus slaps Arius. <laughs> so, Arius attends, he presents his views um, that we're trying to reach consensus, and so um, uh, we want to, Constantine wanted to have this brought uh, so that this could be uh, figured out once and for all. Um, and uh, even though this is a delightful image, uh, St. Nicholas, we have a list of all the bishops that attended. St. Nicholas is not on that list. This story is a couple hundred years uh, later in Lives of St. Nicholas and so forth. And so him slapping Arius is probably just legend, but you can, um, Arius does get smacked down at this, and so it is, uh, it does kind of, what, what actually results um, is history, which is to say he, it was not a unanimous decision. Arius had a bunch of supporters, but it was by far and away the majority view was anti-Arian view, the, what becomes the Nicene view. Um, and so Arius' views are rejected at Nicaea, like I say, while he had some 
very loyal supporters there. The council condemned his Christology as a heresy. And almost all the depictions of Nicaea are kind of like this, where you see at the center, there's the emperor Constantine, and he's surrounded by all of the assembled bishops of the empire. And then what people don't always notice, but it's almost always in all of these pictures and icons is, there's Arius right there, um, kneeling or lying prostrate, condemned uh, as a heretic at the feet of the emperor in most pictures of the council. Um, this is a much later depiction here, medieval um, depiction. And in this case, you can see at the bottom where Arius would have been sitting. So Constantine is there and the bishops are all around him. And then at the bottom, it says, heretici Ariani, damnati. <laughs> anyway, so they, and they're all taking Arius's books and they're putting them into a pile and they're lighting them on fire. So um, the emperor Constantine, at the conclusion of the council issued a decree against Arius and against Arianism. He said, if any writing composed by Arius should be found, it should be handed over to the flames, so that not only will the wickedness of his teaching be obliterated, but nothing will be left to even remind anyone of him. Further, he went on to decree that if you find anybody actually secretly hiding uh, an Arian book, if they've got it in their, in a, in their crawl space or under their pillow or something so that you're not seeing it and you find them have it after they've been hiding it that person's going to be executed so um, he's pretty serious about uh, stamping out heresy this is an emperor who has recently um, issued the edict of milan the issue of toleration so people are allowed to worship as they please throughout the empire but tolerance is not going to include tolerance for christian heresy um, and that's a precedent that's set here right at the very beginning of the imperial uh, church. So in the next 10 years, Arius was forced to recant his views. He rewrote his books to obliterate all of the um, problematic writings, the writings that had been declared heresy. After he did all that, he was restored to communion, even though lots of bishops still opposed him and didn't like him. When he's visiting Constantinople, the bishop of Constantinople um, didn't want him to speak and actually prayed that uh, he wouldn't be able to, that God would strike him down. And then what ends up happening is he has a sudden malady, um, kind of explosive uh, internal malady, uh, which is very painful and horrible and caused him to die. Um, his enemies cited that as divine retribution for his heresy, but lots of other people said, Sir looked at like he was poisoned to death, so he had a very gruesome death as depicted here. Nevertheless, despite Arius' death and the edict banning his teachings, Arian Christology continued to make sense to a large number of Christians for centuries. It took another five decades for Roman emperors to stamp out Arianism within the bounds of the empire. So one of Constantine's um, successors, Justinian, Justinian, I'm not Justinian, um, Julian, sorry, Julian the Apostate, as he's called, um, uh, wanted to stop, have, stop promoting Christianity and stop patronizing it, the imperial government patronizing it. And he also ended imperial persecution of heretics. He said, well, I can't take, the, the government is no longer going to, um, we're, we're going to have tolerance for heretics too. So Arianism gets a little, um, uh, boost during Julian's short reign. Meanwhile, um, a Gothic convert, a Germanic convert, who went on to become an Arian bishop, so not part of the, the mainline church anymore, named Ulfilas, went on to become a very successful missionary to the various Gothic tribes that are living just beyond the Danube frontier or along the Danube frontier north and uh, west of Constantinople. And so there are all of these Germanic tribes. They are actually, in some sense, um, threatening Rome's frontier borders, but sometimes they're employed as mercenaries to protect the Roman frontier from um, worse tribes like the Huns that are gonna come from the, and so forth. Uh, and so they've had a lot of long contact and are kind of semi-Romanized anyway. And so one of the things that happens is that Ulfilas 
translates the Bible into Gothic, and with that wonderful tool, he's able to convert most of the Germanic tribes to Christianity, but because he's an Aryan, he converts them to Aryan Christianity. And so now the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, the, um, uh, the Burgundians, um, they are now all going to be Christians, but they're all, from the standpoint of the Romans, heretic Christians. And that becomes especially painful and ironic when, as the Western Empire collapses and the different uh, Germanic mercenary uh, confederations end up carving it up into different kingdoms, the Swaby Kingdom, the Vandal Kingdom, the Visigothic Kingdom, the Burgundian Kingdom, the Ostrogothic Kingdom, these all become Aryan Christian kingdoms where at least the army and the nobility are all Aryan Christians, although the local people, the Romans, that are being ruled by um, the Germanic uh, uh, nobility, they all continue to be Catholic Orthodox. And so, um, anyway, so this is the, the site, the kind of the state of Christendom uh, as of 495. And so for centuries thereafter, Germanic Aryans ruled over Catholic Roman subjects in the West. And we already saw that at the very beginning, I showed this image from the Aryan baptistry built by King Theodoric the Ostrogoth. Um, and then when the Ostrogothic kingdom was wiped out by the East Roman Empire, when the Byzantines came and reconquered Italy and made Italy a province now of the Byzantine Empire, um, uh, Justinian built a new baptistry uh, just down the street, and this one now is a Catholic Orthodox baptistry, and so that is on the right. And in some ways, they're, it, I would like them to be more different <laughs> to, so that we can explain you know, exactly why, um, why the, the one on the left is expressing a Jesus who is so much less than God. He looks not as godly, right? The, the Jesus on the right is just as naked, but now is more muscular. He is looking more like God the Father in the sense that he's got a, a long hair and a beard and so forth. Um, it's not as clear, though, why in the Orthodox one he's so off-center and John the Baptist is just as much in the middle, you know, which is kind of interesting and, and strange. Um, it's possibly also the fact in the left one, the Holy Spirit has some energy that's coming to... Jesus, and so he's, and that would, he's not an adoptionist, so I'm not sure exactly why. So who, who do you wonder, in both of these cases, is this guy with white hair and a white beard and his, and his you know, kind of a low slung skirt on, and is holding this kind of branch. And you can see him on the left in the Aryan baptistry, and then he's on the right kind of in the background in the Orthodox one, the Catholic one. Who do you suppose that is? Is God the Father? No, <laughs> that is the River Jordan personified, which is frankly, as far as I can see, see it myself as a holdover of a pagan image. Essentially, this is the image of you know, rivers that were gods. The Tiber is a god and so forth. And essentially, this is, the, this is River Jordan and why, why River Jordan is pictured even all the way. So it just shows how long these conceptual and artistic traditions kind of continue. Um, anyway, so it's very interesting. So that represents the River Jordan personified. Okay, so the end of the Germanic Aryan kingdom. So as I mentioned, the Ostrogoths ended up getting wiped out by the Byzantines, and so did the Vandals. Um, the Swaby, uh, I think, mostly got wiped out by the Visigoths. The Visigoths in Spain ultimately converted to Catholicism, so that ended Arianism there, uh, and the Burgundians also converted eventually. And in fact, actually what ends up happening is with the rise of Islam, um, several of the heartlands of Christianity, Syria, Egypt, North Africa, and then even Spain for a time, um, are now become under Muslim rule. And so all of these kind of Arian areas are wiped out, uh, and the, the sole um, Germanic tribe that had converted to being Catholic, the Franks, end up being the dominant uh, Germanic kingdom uh, thereafter. And so that ends the 
uh, problem for, from the Catholic and Orthodox perspective of Arianism as Arianism is ultimately stamped out. All right, so I want to go back and look at how, how to understand the idea, the Nicene Trinitarian formula um, that won out. So we've already said, you know, this formula of how we understand the unknowable, unseeable, creator, the Father, the Father's Word, Logos, the Father's Wisdom, the Savior, the Christos, the Christ, how those uh, are both God, but are not the same as each other, and also how God's Spirit is God, but is not the Father or the Son, right? So, um, in order to express this complicated idea, um, the Council of Nicaea created a creed, and creed is from the um, our word in English, creed is from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. Um, we still quote, Christians still quote a creed called the Nicene Creed, but that is actually a later development. And so um, the original creed that comes out of the Council of Nicaea is different. And I'm going to read the original one, since this is the one that is created uh, to try to create Christian unity after suppressing Arianism. And so the original creed reads, we believe in one God, the Father, so that's going to be one God, and now we're going to, we're going to explain the three components of the one God. So we believe in one God, and that is the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. So, so this unbegotten thing is not the same thing is what, as far as the Nicene guys are concerned with what Arius is arguing. Consubstantial with the Father. So unlike what Arius is saying, where there's no substance interplayed, no intermixing of substances in, among the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No. They are consubstantial. They are the same substance. By whom all things were made both in heaven and on earth. So the idea um, that wisdom has in the book of Proverbs, that as all creation is being made, wisdom is right there by God's side. So in the same way that we understand uh, in the Genesis story, um, and God is present and also present the creator God, the source is present, and also present is the spirit of God, which is resting upon the waters, and also present is God's word, because God speaks and says, let there be light. And so as everything, God's word, in speaking, all things are created, and that word of speaking is Christ. Who, this is more about Christ, for, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And then, and so then we started at the beginning, we believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and, and, and obviously, they hadn't thought as much about the Holy Ghost at this point. That's all they say. We also believe in the Holy Ghost. Um, later, there's much, much of stuff added uh, about the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and so forth. But right at this point, they haven't thought about the Holy Ghost. So, but those who say, so in the original creed here, this is not in the later creed. A lot of those things aren't in the later creed. But in the later, in the later Nicene Creed, all of this anti-Arian stuff, they got rid of. But they needed to say it at the beginning because they're still trying to suppress Arianism. But those who say, there was a time when he was not, and... He was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, or he is of another substance, or essence, or the Son of God is created, or changeable, or alterable. They are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So all of these kind of Arian ideas, nope, 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 nope. That is uh, how we all are going to believe as Nicene Christians going forward. So. Although the Trinity is a paradox, um, I want to point out that it's actually based on contemporary philosophical ideas about how eternal essences can be shared. 
Um, a lot of times we look at things from history, a historical artifact, and it looks so strange and alien and wackadoodle, but actually almost everything is always uh, can just very be very uh, easy and understandable outgrowth of its immediate context. And this is true too from the philosophical context uh, when the Trinity is formulated. So Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the beginnings of um, Western philosophy inquired into the ess essence, the essential qualities of various things. So they wanted to find out what is virtue, what is justice, what is goodness, what is the essentialness, the essence, the qualities, and so forth of these eternal concepts. They ultimately are also these monists who argue that there is a single source or a first cause of everything. So Aristotle created a system of examining four causes of beings and central to his inquiry is trying to figure out what is their essential purpose? What is their purpose? And so he looks at it firstly and he says, okay, what is its material cause? Which is to say, what is the thing made of? So if we get a book, book is made out of paper and so forth. That is the material cause of the book, the lowest and first thing. Then what is its form? What is its configuration? So this is the idea in the mind of its sculptor. So, um, so in other words, before we have a thing, how do you shape the clay and have the idea of it? What is its uh, form that it's going to take? The efficient cause, how did it happen? What external forces acted on the object in order for it to be made? So the efficient cause of a baby is its mother. So uh, the mother is the agent that you know, causes that. There's something that caused the mother to exist and so forth, or something the mother could conceive, but the immediate efficient cause of the baby is the mother. And then finally, there's the important, most important cause, the final cause, the end, which is also, it's just to say, the purpose. What is the thing's motive? What is its meaning? The pencil's purpose is for writing. That's what it's for. And that's the most important thing. That's the essence, ultimately, of this, uh, um, the essential quality, anyway, of this thing, the final cause, the purpose. So therefore, substance is really about purpose, and it's not really about matter. And this is very confused in Christianity. Um, Catholics, most Catholics, common Catholics, are, concern, uh, are confused about this themselves. Certainly, Protestants with anti-Catholic rhetoric are very confused, but there is an idea in the uh, sacrament of the Eucharist in the Catholic Church. They believe that there, what happens to the Eucharist when the Mass is performed by the priest is something called transubstantiation, when the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ. And this is almost universally misunderstood to be not, it's called transubstantiation. So the substance has changed and is almost always misunderstood as transmaterialization. So they, people think, oh, well, that now this substance literally has become flesh and blood, when obviously that is not what has happened at all. It has, continues to be materially bread and wine. So. The substance in this context is not what the material is, it is what the purpose is. So it's not its literal material form. What changes is the bread and the wine now have exactly the same purpose of Christ. Christ is also consubstantial and has the same purpose as the Holy Spirit and the Father. So it's all sharing in one substance, one purpose, not one material, and indeed you can't have one material. God is immaterial. That is not about um, material things. God is eternal as opposed to matter, which is transitory and changeable. So transubstantiation, like I say, then is not about the material form of the Eucharist. It is about its purpose. Okay, and this is um, definitely things that uh, the Platonists and other philosophers are continuing to um, develop at this kind of background of this time. We can go, we've had lots of lectures on, on Platonism and other forms and so that we can have a context, but I'll just mention this briefly. So Plato argued 
that immaterial, eternal ideas, Plato's theory of the forms, that the forms, the eternal concepts like goodness, like virtue, those are more real than the perishable matter that we experience in the physical world. After all, you know, every single thing that I, all these clothes are going to be ruined be fairly soon from entropy. This isn't usually your clothes don't last 50 years and so forth. Usually, you know, at some point or other, everything that you see will be very different and gone. Everything in the material world has a life cycle, but goodness, justice, that is eternal. That is always going to be present, just like mathematical concepts, as far as Plato is concerned. So later Neoplatonists elaborated on how the different internal uh, sources, the, the eternal source, the one source, and also the different various eternal forms, how are they interconnected? How are they understood? And they came up with this idea that they were hypostases or a hypostasis. They were in a hypostatic union with one another. And so, for example, um, a really influential Neoplatonist, Plotinus, who himself was ironically very anti-Christian, but nevertheless had all of his ideas um, uh, hijacked and stolen by Christianity and put into Christian theology. So um, Plotinus created a cosmology that had essentially three core hypostases. Uh, and so uh, one of these is the one, one of these then is the divine intellect, and one of these is the world, world soul. So the divine intellect is an emanation of the one, and the world soul is an emanation of the divine intellect, and then the sensible world, the physical world, this material world that is not in hypostatic union with the three, but it is just is lower and material, the world that we can touch and see and taste and so forth, that is an emanation of the world soul. And then we can connect with uh, the spiritual, higher spiritual realities through transcendence. So even though we are existing on the sensible world, we can transcend to the world soul and so forth. Um, and so this is kind of the spiritual cosmology of contemporary um, Greek philosophers, Plat Neoplatonists and so forth. Um, this is, you can see how that's, this could be very similar to the Trinity where you have three uh, beings, including the, the one, the source, that are all in hypostatic union with each other. Um, it's kind of here an emanation. So we have the Son, is, the Logos, God's word is begotten from the source, from the Father. And the spirit proceeds, so emanate, emanate, and so forth. So you can see how that would also be a, a comparable idea. So within this, with this in mind, really, the Trinity is not so alien from its contemporary ancient philosophers. We've got one God consisting of three persons in a union that is hypostatic, which is to say sharing the same purpose and substance, which is also spiritual and immaterial, not material. So in contrast to what um, Arius is saying, the Nicene um, thinkers are saying begotten is not something that happened at some point in the past and is done. So it wasn't that there was no son and then God begot a son and now he has a son and so there, therefore the, the son is begotten. Rather, everything, God is timeless and everything to God is continually happening now. So so therefore, what that means is Christ is being begotten now. Christ is always being begotten. Christ was never not being begotten. Be begottenness is something that is continually happening in an eternal now, in an eternal presence, as is the spirit proceeding from God. It is not something that at some point or other there was no God. And, and, the, and by the way, the Nicene um, folks point out that because God, the source, the one, is unchangeable, there can't have been a time when Christ, the Son, is begotten, because that would mean that the unchangeable, unknowable God had to change. Because if there was a time before God had uh, a Son, 
And there was a time when God was not a father. And so for the father, God the father to um, be unchangeable and eternal and so forth, it also means that it has to be timeless and it can't be, there can't have been some time before there's a son. Right? So, um, so that's a counter um, logical argument against Arianism that the Nicene folks made. So how do we understand this today? <laughs> um, so my denomination, Community of Christ, upholds the Trinity, uh, as does almost all Christian denominations. There's only a very tiny number of um, churches like the Jehovah's Witnesses, like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, the Mormon Church, um, some of the other Adventists. Some, there's a, a small number of newer churches that are, that are non-Trinitarian. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, are sort of sort of Arian again, because they have a one God and Jesus is a lesser divine being, still God, but not really, um, like Arianism. And uh, in terms of the Mormon church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints rejects having a one God. Um, there is no infinite on, omnipotent God because the Father is simply uh, also a progressing being who was once a human and is therefore limited. So it's essentially polytheism, uh, even though Neither of those churches define that that way, in the same way that when I was talking about Muslims having um, the Quran in hypostatic union with God, and therefore they have a dyad. They also don't say that, but I'm just saying that would be the logical conclusion of this based on this theology. So the Trinity, like I say, is an idea that developed in its historical context. The historical Jesus was not a Trinitarian by any means at all, and frankly, none of his first Christian followers, people like Paul and so on, they hadn't formulated this idea of the, of the Trinity. This is something that people came up with as they tried to understand how they wanted to understand that. And so what for me, um, Trinity is understood, best understood as a prism through which Christians have traditionally experienced the divine. And that doesn't mean this is the only way to experience the divine or that God literally exists this way. This is not literal at all. This is immaterial, this is spiritual, and this is conceptual and paradoxical. So how do we understand it? Well, we are now, unlike ancient, medieval, and early modern Christians, we are now living in an era that is after the invention of the academic disciplines of history and archeology span and literary criticism and centuries now of study have shown that there are very wide differences between the biblical portraits of Jesus and the, his, the biblical Jesus and the historical Jesus as I'm saying here. Um, and obviously not to mention the theological Christ uh, an idea that is still developing, you know, at the time the historical Jesus is alive. Um, I'm saying developing because holy wisdom as an idea is already there in Proverbs. Uh, God's logos as a hypostasis of, of God, God's image, God's word, uh, is already there in Philo of Alexandria before, before Christianity. So how do, how do we understand the relationship now between the historical Jesus of Nazareth, now that we have access to him through the discipline of history, something that early Christians, after um, the last Christian who knew Jesus in person died, they no longer had any access to the historical Jesus. How do we understand the relationship of the historical Jesus to the divine man that is portrayed as Jesus Christ in the multiple competing and contradictory portraits that we have in the canonical scriptures and the extra canonical scriptures? And again, how do we define that, that in relationship to the Christ of theology, God's wisdom, God's logos, God's image, God's glory, etc. So, like I've said before, Christians reading gospel accounts in the Bible today even frequently assume that they're effectively reading a biography or a history of things that happened, that they're encountering the historical Jesus. That is absolutely not true. Um, it comes from a total misunderstanding of what biblical texts are, where they came from, what they're for. And when you're reading the Gospels, what you're actually doing is encountering the Jesus Christ of Scripture, which differ for each evangelist. 
even when there's an awareness that the Gospels are not history books, some Christians still assume that evangelists, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, that were disciples, basing their accounts directly on the historical Jesus, and that, as we've seen again and again, is not the case. Rather, um, all four Gospels are anonymous. None of them was written by an eyewitness of the historical Jesus. Rather, the Gospels were written by Christians who had already believed, come to believe in the risen Christ, and it's based on testimonies, and they come to believe that because of the testimonies of disciples who had had visions of the risen Jesus. So if people had visions of the risen Jesus, that made, gave them testimonies that Jesus, the risen Jesus is the Christ. In other words, the Logos, the divine wisdom, this hypostasis of the, uh, the Father, the, the, un, the seeable uh, image of God, of the unseeable God, and so forth. So they, based on that understanding, and uh, they, they wrote their Gospels, and whereas there are some memories of the historical Jesus preserved in those texts, much more important as a source is, in fact, uh, the stories of the Hebrew Bible. And so, actually, the major source is the Bible as opposed to uh, occasional memories of the historical Jesus that have made their way into the text. So, thus, if we just think of it as a development, the historical Jesus inspired visions which converted people to Christianity. Those Christians then wrote scriptures that inspired the idea of Trinity. So, the, this view of the divine, in my view, then, as it developed, is paradoxical. It's a mystery by definition, and it shouldn't be literally or a limitation on, on how God is understood or viewed. Um, oh, I already used that slide. And so the historical Jesus, in my view, in my own 21st century Christology, the historical Jesus didn't perform the supernatural acts that are described in the Gospels. So those kinds of stories are entirely literary. They're in keeping with ancient misunderstandings of physical causation. They're identical to um, any number of ancient books where ancients understood supernatural things to be able to happen, magic, and so forth, and that continued on all the way through the Middle Ages. And so these are not different or unique or in any sense. And uh, in fact, we have all kinds of of accounts that are better in terms of being actual witnesses and so forth than the, than the gospel accounts. Um, rather, so the historical Jesus we get out through history. We shouldn't, and it's not the same as the Christ of Scripture. The sacred stories of Scripture in the gospels, in my opinion, should be read by Christians for their theological and their transcendent messages not because you want it to be a history and not because um, you are excited about the idea that physical magic actually happens in, in the world or something like that. That will misinform your worldview and it will also cause you to miss the actual transcendent message, the philosophical, the ethical, all the other kinds of messages. And finally, the expansive idea of Christ is not simply a story of a historical figure, but it's a part of the way Christians understand and experience the divine in the world. And so this idea is that, yes, we are, monists have always felt that there's one source, it's unseeable, unknowable, it's so distant, we cannot relate to the one. But Jews and also Greek philosophers and others theorize that, wait, we can uh, experience emanations from that source, God's word, God's glory, truth, goodness, virtue, and so forth, and that these uh, are a bridge between this unknowable source and the human world, or in the case of the definition of Christ, fully human, fully divine, in other words, a thing that is, is, um, is conceptually bridging the gap between the unknowable and our own, uh, unknowable and eternal, immaterial, spiritual, and our own uh, material, mortal, present, and so forth. And so that is my uh, thoughts on Arianism versus the Trinity. <laughs> I'd love to drink of water here. Um, 
I want to thank you for supporting the channel. Um, Brad Stewart, thank you uh, for your donation. Filippo uh, Donato, uh, thank you for your support. You also are suggesting um, some lectures. So, for example, a lecture on Proto-Indo-European stuff, swastikas and other symbols found in multiple culture, common gods, connections, I love that stuff. So yeah, those kind of things are where we can see um, overlap. Those are good ideas. I like that. Daryl Scott, thank you for your support of the channel. Dan Howard, thank you for your donation. I appreciate it. Um, Nicholas Serges uh, says, oh, Nicholas came to a lecture here in person once, right? Uh, he asks, can Arianism be seen as an attempt to reconcile the new Christian belief system with the polytheism of previous religions? Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Um, so possibly, I would say. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that actually um, monotheists have had, like the, the Abrahamic religions, so Christianity, uh, Judaism, and Islam have made like a really big deal um, about their um, monotheism as if it's really, really different from paganism and polytheism. So I think that it's not generally as big a deal in terms of the difference as long as your tradition is, is monist. So in other words, if there's simply one source, it doesn't, you know, it, it, that's kind of the more important thing. So as opposed to dualism where where you have two competing pole sources, good and versus evil, or something like that. So, so a, a monist universe where there's one source, it doesn't really matter if you have like the one god, the one source, and then you have, let's say, like the Hindus, you know, three million other gods that are sort of emanations from that source. You still have kind of a a monist system that is about the same, as opposed to like I say, so Judaism. There's still angels. And so what's an angel? An angel is, in some sense, a little g god, right? So it's a divine being that is not, um, not mortal, not human, and so forth. Um, and, so, and so in some ways, um, there's a bunch of, you know, uh, there's, a mono, there's been a long a monotheist bigotry against um, polytheists, you know, all the way back to the beginning. Uh, including polemical stories about idols, which are also uh, false. So people don't believe the idols are gods the way they um, exist in anti-idol stories. Rather, they believe that there is a, a divine force and the, divine, the idol has some kind of sacral connection you know, the, to the, the image, has some sac sacral connection to that god. It's not the god themselves. You can car carve and create a god. So... So it could be, um, but I, I'm not sure. I think that uh, I think it's a, a attempt to um, to fix the logical contradiction at the heart of Trinitarianism. People are uncomfortable with something that, on the first line of math, um, creates something that is a, a false statement in math, and and is therefore doesn't seem that it could be true. Um, why did Arian, Nicholas also asked, why did Arianism uh, pose such a threat to mainline Christianity? Um, I don't, so, I'm, so it's, a, it's, it's definitely caused a division. I don't know that it caused a huge threat. The, the, um, it w ended up being a minority position, and the, uh, you know, once the emperor got involved, it got crushed pretty fast, so it took about 50 years. Um, it's kind of a quirk of history happenstance that um, that the German Germans, um, the Goths, and so on got converted by an Arian, and that therefore it had the second life. Um, you ask why was it more popular with the Germanic subjects of the Roman Empire? It was more popular because um, you know this Ulfilas um, translated uh, the Bible into Gothic, and he and so therefore they they were able these illiterate Germanic peop peoples. You know, they didn't have to try to learn Latin and Greek in order to understand Christianity. They got it preached in their own language, and then it was preached by the guy who translated it was an Arian, so he taught them all to be Arians. And so it continued to be popular with the, um, with the Germanic uh, um, military leaders of the kingdoms in the West Roman Empire um, as a kind of a way to, um, for people who had been 
let's say, socially lower and technologically and culturally lower. So the German barbarians conquer um, the Roman states, but more or less keep everything act, up intact. And yet here are people, so they have a military and a war-like capacity, but once you start moving into the palaces, you also start losing that kind of a thing, and you just become sort of, um, let's say you are maybe feeling culturally inferior because you are sort of bumpkins that you understood that the people you've conquered had a higher culture than you or something like that. And so, but you could, you could hold, hold it out and say, well, but you guys are all heretics. You're all dumb. We know how Christ really is. We're, we have the truth of that. And so I think that there was that sense among the Germanic Aryans that they wanted to keep that, and they did keep it up into, for a long time, um, as a way to hold something over their subjects that they had a little bit of an inferiority complex about. Um, uh, Zelini Sock says um, uh, that my explanation doesn't entirely agree with my explanation of partialism. So, um, so Jesus is 100% God, but not 100% of God. That's a coherent way to phrase the orthodox view. It's not partialism under the Latin Trinitarian model. Also, partialism is only a heresy in Catholicism since the late Middle Ages. Eastern councils don't condemn it, and Protestants are not bound by Lateran councils. Okay, so, so, so yeah, I'm probably, I'm very Latin <laughs> in my outlook as opposed to Greek. So, okay, I appreciate that, um, that we can see that the partialism, therefore, is not the problem. So I pre appreciate you pointing that out, that that definition it wouldn't be a problem in orthodoxy. And I agree with you. It's not, Protestants aren't bound by this stuff. Uh, and so I'm technically not either, you know, since we're, we're a restoration tradition church. Thank you. Um, Normative says, why did early Christians think it was important to have the correct view on these questions Jesus, as depicted in the Gospels, doesn't seem too concerned with that. Yeah, well, well, Norma did, so one thing, um, so Christianity developed in the first place before um, we had how Jesus is depicted in the Gospels. And so, um, and so remember that the Gospels are a later um, uh, iteration. There's already Christians, Christianity exists before the Gospels are made. But that said, like you say, um, Jesus isn't concerned about these things at all, but nevertheless, um, it's a modern uh, Protestant especially thing to be especially concerned with what Jesus is doing in the Gospels because Protestants are, uh, take, are so focused on uh, the biblical text and thinks that's what Christianity is, uh, but that is a modern Protestant idea. And so, um, so having an understanding of how the cosmos works, how um, the truth about God and the universe and so forth, that was pretty important and that was a, a major um, contemporary thing that is going on, not just within Christianity, but it is uh, what all of the um, philosophers, the Greco-Roman philosophers, the different schools, the Stoics, the uh, Epicureans, the, uh, the Cynics and, and so forth, the Pla Pla Platonists, are all kind of wondering about. So, so it is a, a central concern. And um, like you say, it's not a concern as much though of Jesus as portrayed in the gospels, but that is also not the central concern of uh, early Christians. Um, so, Okay, okay, so the name here is Videos for Stuff. I'm confused because I thought you were talking about videos for stuff. The the so there's a guy named Videos for Stuff. Um, in the Orthodox, uh, probably mostly enlisted in the Orthodox version of the Trinity, how can the relationship between God and Jesus be thought of as an actual father-son relationship? That never made sense to me. Um, yeah, well, so it shouldn't be understood as a literal relationship, because this is not, um, anything about the Trinity is not literal. Um, and so it's a, um, it's an analogy kind of situation. And so we have to, uh, the divine realm is totally different and alien from uh, the mortal and the human realm. And so 
Uh, everything is understood by analogy. So the you know the Holy Spirit is not a dove. Um, the we we have this understanding that um, so conceptually for God and Christ, the more um, theological conception of that is that uh, we have. We shouldn't be saying God, we should be saying Father, right? Because since Christ is God too. So um, that the source, the unseeable, unknowable, invisible source, um, that Christ is the wisdom, the word, the image, the logos, the glory, and everything else like that, and hypostatic union of that. And so in that sense, the source um, is, uh, always has an image, attached to it. So, uh, and, and in that sense, it's an analogous situ situation to be saying parent and son, heavenly parent and heavenly son. It is not, uh, though, a um, literal relationship or an actual father-son relationship. Um, Winston Barquez says, uh, why do the synoptics have a low Christology? Is it because they took the divinity of Christ for granted rather than stressed on the historical Jesus with subtle allusions for his divinity? So yeah, it could be a little bit like that. And so, um, so we can't always know, but essentially the every text, we have to kind of be understood. We have to try to get into the feeling of the author. The author needs to be writing for an audience. And so um, those communities, the Markan community, the Lucan community, the Matthewan community, um, they are potentially um, maybe reacting, especially the Markan community, which is really emphasizing, and that's the source kind of of this very uh, grittily human Jesus, is maybe reacting against um, Christian groups that have been arguing for a much higher Christology. So it may be, um, maybe the author of Mark has he heard a lot of people, a lot of other Christians who are kind of really emphasizing a, a fully spiritual or a fully divine Jesus that really wasn't very human. And so this writing the story this way is saying, no, he was, he was a human, he was fully human. And so it also, um, the whole thing is a theological argument. And so that community may be um, also writing in reaction to things that they've heard, or they understand that as their, as their tradition. So yeah, I think that that's an interesting question, and that could well be that. So in other words, they um, that that's how they're seeing it. Um, sometimes people think, well, it's the the synoptics because they're closer to the historical Jesus have a, a lower Christology naturally. But really, what's so interesting with Christianity is with our first writer Paul. Paul has kind of a high Christology, and so. Um, so high Christology emerges really fast uh, in, in the tradition. And so, and so in some sense, the gospel writers can be reacting back to a high Christology that's already existing to create a low Christology in reaction. Uh, Raymond Ortiz says, uh, did Joseph Smith believe in the Trinity at first, but change in the course, believe uh, in a sort of tri-unity of three gods? Uh, the Book of Mormon does mention that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God. So yes, Ray, so in the beginning, so the Trinity is very hard for regular people to understand. Uh, Joseph Smith is a, um, a smart person, but is not a highly uh, educated uh, theologian. And so he is confused by this paradoxical view of the Trinity, like everybody gets often. And so in dictating the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon is actually um, not Trinitarian, it is modalist. So the Book of Mormon talks about God and it will say, uh, Jesus will be speaking and Jesus will say, uh, you know, G I am the Father. So essentially um, that's, not, that's not allowed in Trinitarianism. So it'll say the, it's, not, it's not just um, God and the, fa the Father and the Son are one in purpose. That's how um, um, the later conception of it in Mormonism or formulation of it. In the original Book of Mormon, it is uh, the Son is the Father. The Son is the Eternal Father. Well, that is not, that's so that's anti-Trinitarian. That's not allowed. That's modalism. So in other words, the Son is just a mode of the Father. They're all one being. So then, like you say, at the end of his um, ministry, uh, Joseph Smith rejects monotheism and asserts that 
there is that both um, Jesus and God are not are not the same substance. They're not the same God. They are different gods, and God is Himself not God, because God is merely a man who has progressed to the state where He's at. So He's therefore not infinite, eternal, omnipotent, omnipotent, the source, the one source, and everything like that. Simply a God. So it is a rejection of um, if, exaltation theology that is the um, the doctrine of the Utah Mormon Church is um, a rejection of monotheism. So we reject that. <laughs> so Nicholas Sergis says, would it be curious to know the source of that image subtitled uh, medieval depiction, <laughs> including burning, burning of Arius writings? Yeah, I, I should have, I, I, I'd have to look it up. So yeah, well, I can find it maybe for the comments. It's um, it was definitely Western because it was written in Latin. I could read the Latin out of it. And so I'm thinking it's um, like it was like 11th or 12th century, maybe. So we'll have to find it. Uh, Nathan Gale writes, did Muslim conquerors have differing attitudes regarding Aryans versus uh, Orthodox Catholics? Uh, they... They actually, even though I showed the Muslim map there as kind of wiping everybody out, the Muslims got there after, after the Aryans had gotten wiped out. So, so that, I don't think they did. Um, they, would have, they would have had no different attitudes, so they would have um, tolerated both types of Christians, so you wouldn't be, um, um, they, don't, they wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have persecuted one Christian versus the other. You would allow both uh, both types to live. But in fact, um, the places they conquered, um, Tunisia, so for example, which had been the heart of the Vandal Kingdom, the Byzantines had already destroyed that. And same thing, um, the Visigoths, once they got to Spain, the Visigoths had given up. They, they had, by the time the... Um, by the time uh, the Muslims got there and destroyed the Visigothic kingdom, the Visigoths had already become Orthodox Catholics. So, so even though I showed that kind of those kingdoms all got wiped out, they actually, Arianism got wiped out a little bit before the Muslims got there. Um, Andre uh, Moray says, concerning the River Jordan personified, uh, how much Arianism do you think is still here without people noticing? Could uh, I mentioned other surviving heresies. So I think that, I think modern days, Christians have all become Arians again. Um, I think that absolutely, um, when Christians talk about God, I think that they only mean God the Father. They only mean the source. They don't, and I think that they do not think of Jesus as God. So I think that even if you're a Christian who literally thinks all of the different water into wine, those kind of things are all happening, Jesus is walking on water and stuff like that, that is still... Um, a limited, I think Christian conception of that in modern times is this is small potato stuff and that is a limited kind of divine being who is much lower than God. Uh, which, and so I think um, lots of Christians are, have effectively become Arians even without, um, even while still saying the, the Nicene Creed in a lot of cases. Um, and I think, for example, this is why... Um, why liberation theology has gotten exciting and why the Mormons came up with exaltation theology, because when you don't think of Jesus as fully human and fully divine as an actual God, as actual God and as a bridge, now you suddenly want, again, the unseen, unknowable God to feel for you a little more. You want to have a personal relationship with God that, uh, is un, that no one has seen and can see. And so, like with liberation theology, you want a God that weeps with you. Or with Mormon exaltation theology, you want a God who was once a human being who went through all the things you went through. In, in tr normal Christianity, you don't need that. We already got that in, in Christ. In other words, Christ suffered all those things, you know, fully human, fully divine. We already have, this is already something. You don't need to add that for in, in liberation theology. The, um, the liberation part is great. I'm, I'm just complaining about the theology part of that. Um, oh, we have two related questions. So Darth Rama says... Um, do you think if Arius had won the day, wouldn't Constantine put the full power of the Roman Empire behind his view? Yes, uh, I definitely think that. So I don't think that um, Constantine cared one way or the other about this. He is not a major theological thinker. Constantine wants unity. And so if Arius had been able to argue this, then that would, be, that would have been the way we would have gone. 
uh, and that would be what Christianity, the mainline Christianity would be, and the Nicene view, as we call it, as I've been calling it, the Athanasian view, would have been stamped out. Uh, Miguel Angelo says, as a personal opinion, of course, do you think Arianism could have survived as a world religion? In what ways would have Christianity have saved? Yeah, I think that it could just as easily have been the formulation um, if that had made, become the, the world religion. I mean, if that had become the state religion of the Roman Empire and the state-backed uh, thing. Um, I'm sure how different it would be. Um, People barely understand the Trinity as it is, even though that's the, um, even though that is what the, the the creed is and the belief is. And it seems to me that, I mean, Arianism is a little more understandable, maybe, and uh, and so people have been less confused by it in a sense. Um, but it, I mean, in in a way, it is. It, it is like um, having more acknowledging layers of hierarchy in the divine, right? Because we have now divine being, who, which is definitely less than the one other divine being. So we are getting you know, into a place that is, I guess, more conceptually like um, Hinduism or, or Greco-Roman paganism and so forth. So it would, I'm not sure how, it, would, if it, would, it doesn't necessarily have changed that much. I think it would have continued the same way. Um, Lisa uh, Ruggirello says, do you believe in one Godhead? So, so I guess as a personal belief, so what, what um, so, so Godhead is a, is a synonym, or, f so what does Godhead mean? You have to define the word Godhead, and so, so Godhead is a, um, an English synonym for essentially saying the Trinity, saying, um, you know, the, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so, uh, in that sense, yes, I believe in one Godhead, but not uh, literally, right? So I believe that there is a source, and the prism through which we understand that, as Christians traditionally, is through the Trinity or Godhead. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, I limit uh, God to that, because God could be understand, understood in all kinds of other different ways. Um, through it by people both on this planet and throughout the cosmos and so forth. Jason Smith, oh, thank you so much for your contribution. We really appreciate your support. Um, Normative says, and probably in response to something I said, that logic seems to imply there can't have been a temporal creation to the world since it would require God to change into the creator of the world. Yeah, 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 no, no, I know what I'm saying. So if God, God had a son, yeah, so, um, so that's a good one. <laughs> so, so that would be a good counter argument. What I was saying about the father thing, that, that would be a Nicene argument. And so that is a good counter argument to the logical argument I've made. So, um, yeah, because, we can, because there has to be, so you could say God eternally is always a creator, so and is perpetually creating. But the problem with that, making that statement now, is then that would imply that creation is eternal and creation in the Nicene formulation is not. So, so probably then what, we'd, what you will have encountered uh, here is another logical contradiction to the, the theological such proposal. <laughs> so um, Michelangelo says, um, did Ophelas make a point of teaching that Christ was less than God, or was it implicit and unconscious? Did the Goths actually care about the difference? So yes, he did make a point of teaching Arianism. Um, the Goths did care about the difference. They were very happy that they had their own, you know, they had their own way of understanding it. Um, they generally didn't persecute their Catholic subjects, although they did sometimes. And, uh, but they kind of used it as a way to escape um, hierarchy, right? And so one of the things that could have happened, certainly happened like with the Franks, uh, is that when you conquer the Roman Empire and has this giant local Catholic Roman um, populace, including church hierarchy that continues to exist even after the military gets replaced and the civic government gets replaced, um, then you're under the control in some way of that, uh, that Catholic 
uh, Roman church hierarchy uh, that exists. Whereas the, um, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Burgundians, the Vandals, they didn't have to worry about that because they had their own Vandal Gothic bishops and so forth. The, the local Romans were heretics as far as they were concerned. So they cared about it. Uh, Filippo de Noto says, did I hear correctly, um, was there a rebirth of Arianism in Western Europe in the Middle Ages and what happened to that? Um, I don't think so. Uh, we had the, um, there's a rebirth of, uh, of uh, Manichaeism essentially in the form of, of the Cathars. Um, and so, which is to say it's kind of a spiritual dualism. And so that's maybe what you're thinking about that. I don't know that there's um, a rebirth of Arianism. You'd have to tell me what you're thinking of. Um, Mike Rogers, are the Jehovah's Witnesses inheritors of Arianism? So it's a, um, it was a, a neo I mean, it's a, a neo-Arianism. So, so essentially this idea that, um, that Christ is still God, but just as, I'm sorry, Christ is still a God, like divine and less than, and not of the same substance from the source, God the Father, that is a, an idea that you can come up with independently. So I don't think that the Jehovah's Witnesses um, read Arius or, or were thinking about it in that way, but it's just a kind of a conception that you can come on your, on your own. And so, and so I would say it's kind of a, a neo-Arian idea. I don't know Jehovah's Witnesses enough to, to say that definitively, but that's what I've understood it to be. Um, so, oh, normative. So normative, oh, thank you so much for your support. Um, wasn't, and is this normative also asking or not? Arianism today, oh, Arianism today asks, uh, wasn't Eusebius of Caesarea condemned with Arius? So yes, there was multiple other, I think Eusebius of Caesarea and um, the guy who I was saying from Nicomedia. So in other words, there's multiple other um, Arians that were also condemned. So it was not only Arius that was condemned at the time of that, uh, of the conference. I just kind of simplified the story a little bit. You're right, there's more than one um, bishop that got, who had that, those kind of teachings who were also condemned. Tyson says, um, do you think Peter and Paul would have been more supportive of the doctrine of Arianism or the Trinity? Um, so it's very hard to know what Peter would think because we don't have any, um, any writings that are actually from Peter. Peter obviously had very direct relationship with the historical Jesus. Um, I don't think, I don't really think that Peter would have been particularly comfortable with Arianism or um, uh, the Trinity. Uh, probably Peter might have, um, Peter probably would have been an adoptionist. And so he would have thought that he'd had this wonderful prophet that he'd had this experience with and that at his death or resurrection uh, that that prophet had been begotten uh, by God as, a, as divine and so therefore is adopted by God. So I think that adoptionism is probably one of the more common understandings of it in early Christianity and so that's what I would speculate Peter would be. And that's speculative uh, because we don't have any writings of Peter. I'm just anticipating maybe what based on what was in the ground bags and, and Peter's own experience, what he might have been comfortable with. Um, uh, with Paul, um, yeah, it may be, I mean, again, this hasn't been formulated. Um, I guess I would have to look precisely at what Paul is exactly saying for his formulation, but it would be definitely this an idea that, that Christ is, um, so Christ is Lord, Christ is the Logos. So it is, um, so it could be interpreted either Arian or Trinitarian, but maybe it's probably, Paul maybe would have been closer still to Arian yet, but it's not formulated yet. So uh, there's two related questions. Um, Rain Weber asks, as opposed to the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is barely mentioned in the Bible. At what point was this holy breath raised in importance and equal to God. Well, you could even see here rain in the Nicene Creed. 
there was all of this stuff about what Christ is and all of this. It went on and on and on. And yet, and yet the original Nicene Creed, it just said, and the Holy Ghost. That's so they just said, ah, we also believe in the Holy Ghost. It's almost just along for the ride. And so there is, um, there is a, there's biblical precedence for, for having this God's spirit. I mentioned at several places, so like there's the, um, the creation story where the creator is present at the beginning and, uh, and the spirit of God is there. The Holy Spirit is on the, on the surface of the water and then God's word is present when God speaks. Um, another example for Christians is the three angels that are visiting Abraham and Sarah which are understood to be the three persons of the Trinity. Another one is the baptism of Jesus, where the unseen creator is there as a voice from the heaven. The spirit is descending on Jesus in the form of a dove. And, and then Christ is, of course, there at the baptism. And there is a lot of talk in, that Jesus has about um, the gift of the spirit, that the spirit will be present with among us and so forth. So the spirit is there the whole time, but un understanding of the spirit is, um, it, it's like you say, it's much less, people are much less focused on it and they are much less worried about it. And ultimately in terms of the formulation of hypostases and, and, and uh, constantial, 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 uh, consubstantialism. <laughs> so there is all of these crazy um, uh, complex, complex um, ways of understanding the persons of God. The Holy Spirit is pretty much along for the ride. And so people aren't, aren't as worried about it. And once they've got a way of understanding Christ and the source together, then they can also throw the Holy Spirit in, like I say, for the ride. Leah Delano says, I don't understand what the Holy Spirit is. <laughs> so the image is a dove. Is it related to our soul? I'm sorry to ask such a basic question. No, Leah, no, don't be sorry. It, this was specifically, the, we're going to have to do a lecture when trying to figure out the Holy Spirit. This is specifically a Christological um, lecture, and that's why we, I haven't focused on it. Um, there's a lot of different ways to understand God's Spirit. Um, so a lot of ways that uh, it's understood, for example, is as a source of inspiration, a source of comfort. Um, um, formulation that I always like it, it that is St. Augustine taught that um, at a certain moment you've been studying and you can't understand anything, no matter how much you, you've read all of these books and listened to all these lectures on quantum physics, it doesn't make any sense. And then suddenly you have an epiphany, it all breaks forth and together and you feel like you get it and you really understand it and you're just filled with that sense of uh, calm and wow and awe and, and so forth. That moment of epiphany is what, um, what St. Augustine calls the Holy Spirit. So what does that all mean? So it's, it's, we'd have to have a whole lecture about it, but no, yeah, I appreciate that we haven't gone into it. It's very complicated. So thank you so much for all of these questions and great uh, comments and also your support. We really appreciate it. Um, like I said, it won't be a lecture next week, but two weeks from now, uh, be sure to join us when we look at all of those mystery religions.